Okay, so welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, SD LAN design. Um, the objective here is to, uh, you know, SD LAN is, or it's, the presentation is predominantly going to be based around software defined access from Cisco, but um, there is other, uh, you know, SD and LAN solutions out there like from Jupyter Extreme and things like that, and they all work slightly differently. Um, but I'm most familiar with um, Cisco SDA, so that's what I'm going to talk about from the building blocks, and we're just going to kind of work through a journey as to how we get to something which the majority of people have got at the moment, to where uh, the industry is going with um, software-defined networking, orchestration platforms, management platforms like DNA Center and things like that. Um, and yeah, so I thought it would be quite an interesting topic uh, to to talk about. So hopefully that's the the thing that you're here for and what you're expecting to hear about. So if you're here, you probably know me. Uh, if not personally, direct directly or whatever, you probably know me through the industry. Some of the other content that I do. Um, just one thing actually before I I go any further. I take it my sound is okay. There's no issues with the sound, and you can actually hear me talking. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Good. Uh, right, so so yeah, you probably know me. I'm not going to bore you with this stuff going through it uh, bit by bit, but 15 years plus in the industry, predominantly uh, focused on IT support initially from about 2003, and then since about 2007, I've been specialised in networking technology. So I've worked pretty much across the full networking stack, LAN, WAN, security, wireless, data center, uh, engineer, consultant, architecture level, and now work for myself as a consultant um, for MNB Networks, which is my company. And I'm CCD certified, various other certifications, et cetera, et cetera. So, so who are you? Uh, I don't think everybody who signed up this is what I said in the in the mail thing. I had 108 sign-ups, and these are the countries. So, thanks or places. Some of them aren't countries. Some of them are, are cities, I think. But uh, thanks for thanks for signing up. I appreciate the global audience with different time zones and things like that. And uh, so let's move on into what we're actually here to talk about. So, SD LAN. I am recording the session. So. Um, the plan is to put it up on YouTube after. It will run for an hour. If there's any questions throughout, put them in the chat and I'll answer them at the end or a natural sort of break points because I've found that if I'm answering questions as I go along, it makes the presentation go on longer and longer and it can go off at a bit of a tangent. But I do have the chat window open and I'm keeping an eye on it to the side. Um, so this is the agenda, uh, pretty much what I put on the LinkedIn post. Uh, we'll talk about what our, an existing campus looks like, the building blocks. Some people here might be experts and have more expertise in software-defined access or SD LAN than me. Some people might just be uh, entering into their network design career, and some people might be in the middle. So I'm trying to put a bit in for everybody and balance it out and explain it in a in a way that's easy to understand, regardless of whether we're talking about advanced topics or or whatever. So, um, to to start off, then the, the typical campus overview. That's what most of you are probably going to have in at the moment, because although SD access and uh, SD LAN is starting to um, you know take off, I think it's still Personally, it's still uh, a fairly new technology, and some customers are quite reluctant to to deploy it sort of outside a POC or something like that. Maybe if there's a small network, um, it, it it might have been deployed uh, in in there as a as a pilot and then moved into production or something like that. But uh, I know it's moved on a lot in the last couple of years, so. Um, Half the battle, though, is getting from where you are at the moment to, to actually having this thing in and working. Um, we'll talk about, in generic terms, what a SD-LAN campus 
would look like. And again, that's based on software defined access from Cisco, only because I'm familiar with the building blocks of it. Um, getting from A to B, migration, I've said uh, the migration is a tricky business because uh, sometimes it's in the eye of the beholder, it looks easy, uh, but when you actually get down to it, there's stuff that you know is going to potentially cause you an issue, and that might be something that uh, has been missed out of, or, or an assumption has been made about. So um, the, the final thing, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the considerations uh, in regard to the migration and getting from A to B throughout the presentation. So that the first three are kind of in logical order. And then the last point, this one here, we, we highlight considerations throughout the whole presentation. <clears throat> so on the screen, uh, to start off then, I'll try annotating this just on the, the PowerPoint. The, the rest of the slides are just uh, pictures. There's no more, there's not more uh, text. So we'll, I'll try to draw over this in presentation view just to make it um, a bit less clunky. So what we're talking about here is a, is a typical campus environment, which is highlighted up here, right? And a typical campus environment from a design perspective is, very, is usually very straightforward. So you have um, effectively any network that you design, the objective is to get to some services. So we've got some services up here, and we'll talk about what those actually are uh, as we move through the presentation. Um, but yeah, the, the, the user down here, regardless of what VLAN or whatever they're on, they need to get to those services. And how they get to them from a network perspective, if you're talking about campus network design, is the user will connect their PC to an access layer switch, which is layer two only. So again, sticking with Cisco terminology, uh, that's something, it could be ranged from anything from like a, a basic layer two switch, like a 2960, um, and there's, there's, you know, there's still a lot of those, even the old 2960S stackables kicking about in various different customer networks. Um, and they connect via layer two, um, or their laptop connects to layer two, uh, via layer two, an access port or, or a port which is configured for a voice VLAN and an access layer VLAN. And then that VLAN, so if we, I've drawn a red user in here. So ultimately, if this person here wants to get to these services, um, their PC will go over into the switch in the access layer. That will be configured with a trunk. They'll hit the routed switched uh, virtual interface or SVI. And then they'll either route this way or over the other uh, through the firewall, etc., in order to get to the services. So that's really straightforward. And the key points here for consideration, if I just change my ink color to make it a bit more readable, are you see here the layer two and the layer three demarcation points indicate what I just described. Um, what else? Uh, you know, you might, I've, I've just drawn here, you might have like full redundancy or it might be port channels to, to from the distribution to the core. But the, the virtual interfaces are hosted on the, the distribution switch, and that's where I guess the user first has network communication from a, a routing perspective. Um, another thing to note is I've broken it out here into uh, core distribution and access. And just to uh, level set for anybody who doesn't know or, or has forgotten or needs a, a refresh, the core is all about switching packets or routing packets and getting traffic as fast as it can to where it needs to get to. So that could be getting it you know, to the distribution switch or it could be getting it to the firewall or it could be getting it to another core switch if there, for example, was a backbone network in the campus. Um, the distribution layer, for, again, talking traditional network design, um, that's normally where you're going to have um, services. So when I say services, you may ha actually have 
I've got the services pictured up in the you know the right hand corner, um, in in a data center or something behind a firewall. But it may be that they actually just sit off there like that with no firewall. So they may be connected directly to the distribution switch, and that's really common as well. Um, and the access layer is where your machines, devices, users, access points, and everything actually physically connect to the network. So that's really where we're coming from. Uh, and then we'll start talking about an evolution as to where we're going to. So if you if you if we go back here and we look at you know the key the key point that I wanted to make here was that the this line that I'm drawing in thicker green, that's the demarcation point. And the the routing the routed part, the first routed part of the network that the user will come to is on the distribution switch. Um, for a number of years, many providers tried to push what they called well, Cisco's terminology is rooted access, right? So rooted access is basically where we move, let me just check my color still green, yeah, it is. Uh, we move the demarcation point to this, you know, to this layer. So everything above that green line on the diagram is layer three capable. Now, this, as you see, is non-SDN layer three rooted access. The design notes and the considerations here are pretty much what you had to think about if you were going from what I just described in the previous picture to this environment. So this environment being default gateways on the access layer switches down in the very bottom of the diagram. So if you see the, the orange uh, subnet, for example, that's present in two locations uh, or two access layer switches, but it's not actually um, the same subnet. So I've got it listed in the top left hand corner of the key as data VLANs. But the one on the left hand side, on the left hand side access switch might be VLAN 10 and subnet 10110 slash 24. But the one on the orange might be subnet 20 and 10220 slash 24. So they're completely separate subnets. And in order for those to communicate with each other, even though they're both user subnets, they would route via uh, up to the distribution switch. Uh, and uh, how that differs from the previous model is you would previously have a broadcast via the, the distribution switch in the legacy design model without layer three rooted access. Um, and yeah, that's that's where you get the potential for if you have a loop, it takes it might take multiple floors down in the building and things like that. So that was, you know, those types of things are what used to be really common. You know, somebody would pick a, go into a meeting room, think that a cable from an IP phone was a, a network cable because there might be loads of cables under the desk, plug it into the wall, cause a spanning tree loop, and then take out floor one. And so if this access layer switch on the left was floor one and the access layer switch on the right with the orange was floor four and somebody caused a loop on the orange VLAN if this was the previous slide he, uh, the previous slide here then we would take out uh, probably take out switch that one and four so that's kind of like the main reason and or one of the main reasons behind um, uh, layer three rooted access now with that it never really took off, and the reason for it, it never really took off in the campus or the, the office environment. And the reason for that is, although it gives you some benefits in regard to um, in regards to like protecting the network, uh, that wasn't something that happened every day, but it happened if you know you had one of these loops. So when you having worked for integrators and uh, Cisco partners for a long time, any time this conversation ever came up with a customer, they would, this point that you see at the top of the um, the design notes and the considerations, the license costs for layer three capability on the access, 
So if you even if you had like a cat three K or a cat uh, uh yeah, some of the two K's done layer three. But anyway, I'm I'm not picking on Cisco, I'm just saying how it is. Um if you approach a customer and you say, um upgrade every single access layer stack to layer three and it's gonna cost fifteen hundred pound per stack uh, just to mitigate the potential for somebody plugging in um you, you know into the wrong port. It it, it was never ever uh, all my time working in partners uh justified because it's not what an IT director or an IT executive is actually looking for unless they're a proper network techie uh, and some people on the on this call might disagree with me but that's just based on my own experience. Um, and if we move down the list, you know, the different considerations are not all bad, it's just considerations. So, um, for example, DHCP helpers in a scenario, you would need, uh, can, instead of configuring the DHCP IP helpers to get to, you know, this file print AD DHCP server where that's located um, for, the, for the end user to get an IP address, you would need to configure that on every single access layer switch or if, or a DHCP scope on every single access layer switch. Um, and that's that's really administrative overhead that people didn't want. Um, the, the subnetting requirements is something that uh, I had a conversation with one of my friends about a couple of weeks ago actually and they were asking, we were just having a general conversation and they said, what are the other considerations for layer three? And I said, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to use additional subnets, uh, and the, the kind of question that, and, and I said, well, if you if you formerly in this picture had an orange subnet stretch, and I'm not saying that that's that's a great approach, but if you had like a a, a a subnet for a floor, let's say a data subnet, and it was a slash 24, you had 100 users, then you've got one slash 24, and then on this. DHCP server at the top, you have one slash twenty four network, and then um, you know that's that's where the users get their IP address from. If you follow this model here, where the, the default gateway is defined on every access layer switch, that actually has a knock on effect to the infrastructure and the server team, because if the network team decide to go and reconfigure all the access layer stacks to have um, you know, layer three access, uh, it, it causes a challenge where that results in a request where it has to go to the server team and you have to say, right, we used to have, let's say that orange subnet, this was one floor, and that orange subnet was actually on every one of these switch stacks. We have to go and we have to say, you know how we've got a uh, floor one and it's got the slash 24 subnet, can you can you now change that and also add these additional three subnets and let me know when it's done and then we'll start reconfiguring. So you can see how um, unless it was a complete greenfield and a, or a segment of a network that you were talking about that you were doing it from scratch, there wasn't ever ever really like a, a something that would sell it to uh, managers and directors and things like that. A, to invest the thousands of pounds to upgrade all the switches, because uh, sometimes if you wanted a consistent design as well, you might have like CAT 3Ks in a part of your network, but only CAT 2Ks or uh, you know mini switches or something in another part of your network. So it, it all comes into, uh, you know, those considerations were there as well. So, uh, and then the other thing is, I know we always talk about it on Twitter and stuff like that, it's not really best practice to stretch layer two, but unfortunately in campus networks, uh, there's the, there's more requirement for things uh, to be stretched between multiple stacks. So if you think in hospitals, you've got things like, I've deployed things like digital signage, uh, IP TV and waiting rooms, things like that. These are normally, you, you know, you normally have what you see at the bottom here. So you normally have, uh, sorry, not what we see here. You normally have what you see in here in, in the past where you've got, you know, you might have like a, a, a subnet per switch stack. 
like so that's nice and clean but if you need like you see the blue subnet in this diagram that might be required across everywhere so if you move to the the layer three rooted access design well, i actually had it pictured in here anyway but if you see the blue subnet i've got you know voice vlan for example so if that was across the floor uh, you might just want one voice vlan across the whole floor rather than and one slash 24. Um, and with this with this topology and rooted access between the distribution or the collapsed distribution slash core that's not possible uh, with a layer 3 rooted access so it, get, it it was a little bit inflexible from that perspective because although layer 2 being stretched isn't ideal it is required sometimes uh, and I, I gave a couple of examples so IPTV digital signage and that's normally to do with um, simplify, simplifying a multicast configuration, for example. So uh, digital signage and uh, IPTV normally just sit on a, a shared subnet uh, with IGMP snooping and, a, and an IGMP snooping query on the distribution switch, configured on the distribution switch or whatever the you know the device that it relates to, um, and you know it's just easier than enabling PIM all over the network. Uh, inconsistently, so that's uh, that's kind of where we've 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 evolved from, um, and where we're going to. So 